Hello and good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thank you all for joining. We are, I'm back in my studio today. The air has cleared up. So things are looking a lot better here in Portland right now. And I can actually breathe again outside, which is nice to not be just inhaling smoke all day long. So welcome back. Um, things are more or less back to normal today here. I've got a pretty much normal show for, uh, in stock for you. I feel like I haven't done one of these the sort of normal way in a while. It's been a lot of uh, experiments lately. So we'll see how it goes, though. We'll see how it goes. Uh, the one thing that I did change was the music and the I'm, I've got this little MP3 player instead of um, the iPod. I've been using an iPod and it's just annoying to keep it charged all the time. So I decided to try this out and I don't quite have the levels dialed in yet. I think so it's just coming out of the headphone jack and I had to set the ATEM to the mic level, which doesn't seem right to me. So otherwise it's just really quiet. Anyway, I'm still trying that out. Got some music on there from the YouTube library. I just went to the YouTube, the YouTube library thing that they give you in the studio. And it's a bunch of music that's free to use on YouTube. So I figured that's the easiest way to deal with the licensing of music. And yeah, it was loud. I don't know why it was loud. Uh, it didn't sound distorted to me when I was listening to it. That's what I was checking for. So uh, I guess, well, well, I'll deal with that later. Anyway, let me know where you're joining from because I'm go I've got my map again since I'm back in the studio. So it looks like we got a few people already introducing themselves in the chat. And again, thanks all for joining. So if this is your first time here, uh, welcome. I know I got a bunch of new people from the video I did last week about the Raspberry Pi. So that was a, that was a fun video. That was, that was a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to doing more experiments with the Raspberry Pi as well. It's proving to be a fun little device for using for various little tools in the studio here. And speaking of the Raspberry Pi, the little signal lost clip that you saw at the beginning just now was actually being played from the Raspberry Pi emulating the HyperDeck. So as far as my ATEM is concerned, it thinks it's a HyperDeck. I can start and stop it on there. And it is uh, working pretty well. So I'll talk more about that in a second. But that is all thanks to um, Jonas, who is in the chat. I saw him in the chat earlier. So the, yeah, so that's up and running and it is available. So I'll talk more about that in a second. If you are just joining for the first time, then most of the what I'm going to talk about today is going to be whatever you want to talk about. So feel free to ask me any questions about live streaming, the A10 Mini. I've got my normal dual A10 Mini set up on my desk here. I've got, um, we, we demoed the YOLO box last week. That was a fun adventure out into the smoke. So happy to talk about all things live streaming. Uh, how do I do this map? This is actually some uh, custom code I wrote because I wanted to. I noticed people were introducing themselves by saying where they were from anyway, so I thought I would take advantage of that and uh, run it through, uh, actually drop pins on a map. So what it's doing is actually whatever you say, whenever it looks like a location name, which I've got some code in there to, um, I've got some code in there to sort of remove things like the words like hello and, and those kind of greeting words. And then if it looks like the, if it looks like a location name, it feeds it off into Google's geocoder, which will turn it into a location and then drops a pin on the map. So it is, um, it's actually, I, I did publish the code. So if you are interested in using it yourself, you can, and I will drop a link to that in the chat. It's not packaged up well. So, it's a lot of work to get it running unless you're familiar with software development. At some point, I might try to make this a little bit nicer to uh, to use for other people. But the but yeah, the right now it's just I figure if other people want to take a look and try it out, go for it. But it is not packaged yet. Ideally, it would be like a website that you could just go to and then you could 
full screen and play it into a browser or bring it into OBS or something, but it is, it is not that yet. Part of the reason is because of Google's API keys and li rate limits and things like that. So I haven't gone through the trouble of sorting all that out yet. Anyway, uh, thank you for, for playing the map game. That's always a nice way to start the streams. And, um, and yes, it is, it is not an exact science. If you say whatever you, whatever you say, it's going to feed into the geocoder. So yeah, you can, you can make some pins appear in funny locations if you really wanted to, but please don't, I, you know, try to, try to be nice. Uh, one thing I did start doing is after the stream and go back to the, through the map and take a look at it and then drop pins on my actual globe, which I got, uh, last or two weeks ago. So this is now my actual, uh, physical representation of, of that map, which is pretty fun. So I'll just keep adding pins to this over time. And I think that's pretty cute. It looks nice on Voodoo Globe. Looks nice on the background there. All right, so let's get started here. What, where, where should we start? Let me first um, switch over back over to the, the chat so I can show that on the screen. the wrong tab. This is going over my Chromecast. All right. So again, reminder, if you do have a question for me, um, please make sure to mention my full name because then it shows up orange on my screen. You'll probably see that when I switch over to my computer at, at some point. So the uh, that just makes it um, a little easier for me to skim through and actually see the specific questions. Starting with Rick says, bring that on. There we go. Ask people to like the video. Yes, please do give this video a thumbs up. I know it's a little early. I haven't actually done anything yet, but if at any point you feel like I've given you some value, then give this video a thumbs up. All right. Thanks, Curtis. Good to see you here. Thanks for joining as always. I'm pretty, I think Curtis has a stream later today. I'm not going to, I'm not going to clobber his time uh, today. So I'll be, you're all free to check out his stream after mine ends. Oh, this is a good question. I noticed this. So Graham, the, yeah, when you add, what, what Graham is talking about is when you add custom streaming locations, let me make sure I'm not going to reveal my stream key when I do this, when you add custom streaming locations to the to the ATEM software, then what happens is, oops, this window, what happens is you get all these little things in this dropdown. And as you can see, it's starting to get a little bit full. And I've got a couple of these uh, old ones I was experimenting with, and I can't figure out how to get rid of them because this is, this is not, uh, only some of these are in the streaming.xml file. Like if you look at my streaming.xml, it's actually, uh, only got, let's see, it's got Facebook service. So it's got Facebook, Twitch, YouTube, this one, and owncast, but that's it, right? And then here I've got more because there's this really cool feature, which is this load streaming settings button. And this lets you bring in one of those entries from a standalone file which is how they're planning on launching this with the uh, streaming bridge so that you can like use their software to create an XML file for the streaming bridge and then load those settings in, send that to somebody so that they can load it in without having to edit XML, which is really great because I don't like having to tell people go open up your streaming.xml and then, you know, do all this fiddly stuff in here. So instead you can just ship a file, which they can load in here. The problem is that then, it shows up in the dropdown and you can't get rid of it. And because it's not in the streaming.xml. Anyway, that's a bug. I'm sure they're going to fix it because they haven't actually shipped the streaming bridge yet. So as soon as they ship that, I'm sure there'll be a software update for this, which will then probably, hopefully fix that so I can clean this up because yeah, it gets a little cluttered. And I just noticed my background changed, which means there is a super chat here. Thank you for that. Um, we skip down to the super chat. Thank you, Camille, very much. Appreciate it. 
And yeah, if you didn't notice, I didn't notice because I was looking at my screen. My background color changes when I uh, when you give me a super chat. All right, let me go back to. So yeah, that was a good question about the custom streams. Again, I'm sure they're going to fix that when they ship it. Cyber Shadow says you should really do an FAQ how you do the map chat circular key. Absolutely, I am long overdue to do a proper like here's how I do the map video here's how I do the chat video uh, because I, I hadn't really done that because I hadn't actually like dialed it in but I feel like I've lately been doing the same thing every time now so I've got my my presets and everything so I can definitely definitely now put that on the list of videos to do my list is very long so we'll see when that happens Pickle Jar says, can you provide a resource for the cool globe? Yeah, let me see if I can find that. I think I just I think I just got it off of Amazon, honestly. I just looked for a, a globe that was uh, white because I wanted it to not be the ugly blue and green color because those are never, never nice color schemes. And you can kind of tell I've got a little color scheme thing going on back here. So trying to um, keep that consistent whenever I can. But yeah, I just found that. So let me drop this here and grab this link for you. Looks like it may not be available in all the countries. So your mileage may vary. Okay, there's the cool globe. I'm gonna keep going. I know there's a lot of people in here and there's a lot of chat that I'm way behind on now. So let me, uh, let me just keep going. All right. Show your full setup from Lorenzo. Not right now. We'll see. Maybe in a little bit. I know I've done it on a few other streams. So, um, if you do get back through, I usually, when I do a tour, I usually put a timestamp to it in the description. So that's a good place to find one. I did, I did on the 10 K stream two weeks ago. I did a full tour, tour, full tour of the whole room here, and that is definitely time stamped in the in that video. The uh, sneak peek of or not sneak peek, just what I've got on my desk here um, is this. So this is my normal setup, where I've got the uh, two ATEMs over here. This is the one that's doing the streaming. This is the one that's got the Raspberry Pi and the HyperDeck plugged in as well as so I can like show you settings in the ATEM without revealing my stream key and things like that. My HyperDeck is up here. This is the new Raspberry Pi, which I'm going to talk about in a second, running that cool software. Small monitor, big monitor, same thing. My computer's feeding both, uh, both of those. So that way I can show you what's on this screen and um, you can see what I see. Can you plug in a tablet or iPad or iPhone into the mic jack to bring in music? Yes, you certainly can. That's what I was doing at the beginning of the stream. However, you do have to make sure that you get the levels right. And for whatever reason, my iPod works better at line level. This one was too quiet at line level, so I switched to mic, but that made it loud, but it wasn't distorted. So I still have some figuring out to do there. Uh, Ronald says, what are the advantages of, of, of using a Chromecast? That's a really good question. The reason I've been using the Chromecast is because it effectively gives my computer an extra HDMI output. So I don't have to worry about my computer thinking it's an actual display, which is sometimes it gets hard to manage that many displays. So my computer right now thinks there's only one external monitor, which is actually then mirrored to the physical monitor here as well as into the ATEM. My computer sees that as one monitor. And then the Chromecast instead of it being a separate monitor, what it lets me do is actually share an individual tab of a browser. So I can share like what you're seeing here. This is the browser I'm using. And notice that like when I'm moving this around, this over here doesn't change, right? This because this tab is being shared, not the screen. It also means that I can like go over to here and that's still showing the chat. So it gives me like, an extra sort of virtual monitor that is a lot more, uh, a lot easier to manage. The only downside is that sometimes the, um, it's 
so it's, it's a little bit delayed it's a little bit more delayed than normal like if you watch what's on the stream versus what's what's here like if i if i tap this uh, again you're going to see the animation and notice that lag right like you're you're seeing on the stream the overlay and if you can also just look over here like these are happening at different speeds right because this is my computer screen being mirrored this is the chromecast so there's a little bit of a delay it's not terrible especially for this kind of thing it would be awful for video but for this kind of thing it's fine the other downside is it is over over wi-fi which means that if your wi-fi gets congested it can start scale downscaling the the quality so it'll try to keep up the speed by downscaling the quality which means you start getting little pixely edges or weird compression artifacts on that image so it's not perfect but i do like i do like it for this use and it's been more or less fine so yeah um thank you peter thank you for the super chat i appreciate it all right people want to know about the hyperdeck simulator yes let's talk about that so again this is not my doing this is all thanks to Jonas. And he, I saw him in the chat here, and he has done an amazing job at writing the software to emulate a HyperDeck in, on a Raspberry Pi, or I guess any computer, but it's specifically built for the Raspberry Pi. And let me start, oh, I forgot to bring up that, where is that web page for it? I thought I had that in a tab. See, I try to get all prepared ahead of time. And sometimes I just forget a link. It is. Oh man. Okay. I have to, well, you know what, Jonas, you can drop a link in the chat. If I, if I don't, uh, yeah, since I can't find that right now. Um, but let me show you how it works. Go over to, let's see, how am I going to show this? I didn't, I haven't actually thought through this demo too much. <laughs> it's the downside of, of doing this stuff on the fly. So the, the way this works is you install, you install the software on a Raspberry Pi, or you, you can, he'll also ship you an image that you can just burn onto an SD card. So that's what I'm running here. It was an image that's just shipped. Um, I just downloaded use the Raspberry Pi utility to burn it onto an SD card. And then it boots up. And what you get is a, it actually is like, it just boots up and it's the software is running. It's like, doesn't even, like, there's not even anything to look at because it just runs. So the, let's see, let me show you the multi view of the other one. That'll, that'll work. So this is the multi view of the ATEM that the, the Raspberry Pi is plugged into. You can see the, you can see, yeah, you can see the um, HyperDeck is plugged into that input three, but the Raspberry Pi is an input four running that signal lost animation. And on my computer, this is the sort of control interface for it. So the, What this is, is effectively like a little web interface to manage the media playing, but it can also, of course, be controlled by the ATEM, which is why this is unique. So this alone is enough to just like play stuff, pause, stop. You can also choose different video clips and, you know, play the different video clips. This you can also load files onto, so you can just upload stuff. And let's see, oh, I guess not MOVs, only MP4s. So I can, I can use this web interface to add files into the Raspberry Pi and, that, and it's gonna store them there in the Pi and show up in this list. So this is, this is already pretty cool, right? Because now I have this nice little web interface to, to start and stop clips. You might notice that I'm accessing this from my computer, not from the, from the Raspberry Pi. The Raspberry Pi's monitor is plugged in to the ATEM. And that's what's showing that animation. Let me see if I can mess it up by closing or like switching apps or something in the Pi. Yeah, so you can kind of see. 
you can kind of see when I do this alt tab, like it's actually a run, a running a Chrome browser, right? So this is just a Raspberry Pi in here running a browser that's playing this, uh, playing that, that loop. And my computer is then pointed at the IP address of the Pi into this control app. I think if I do this, it actually shows the, yeah, that's the image that the Pi is actually showing. And if I go to slash control, that's the control page for it. So you can control it remotely from a web browser, which is great. However, you can also control it from the ATEM. So in here, I've got in the hyperdeck settings, uh oh, why did it fail to connect? So this is my actual hyperdeck on input three. And then let's see, this is another weird bug I wish Blackmagic would fix is um, if it does get in this disconnected state, the connect button's disabled, so I can't tell it to connect until I change the value. And if I set it back to the same value, it doesn't let me connect again. So I have to set it to the wrong value and then set it to the right value. Okay, so there, now it's connected. I tell it's on input four and hit save. And now over in the media player tab, I have two hyperdecks. I have my real one and I have the Raspberry Pi. And now when I hit play, it'll actually start playing the clip on the Raspberry Pi. And again, it, 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 lo it shows the options here. So I've got the two different videos and I can switch between them from the ATEM software or from, or from the web interface. So because it's in the ATEM software, of course, that means I can, um, that means I can automate it with macros, right? So now I can go in and write a macro to select a clip, change the input, play, all by using the Pi. So it's a pretty affordable way to replace a HyperDeck because it does not require buying the $600 HyperDeck or 700 or whatever it is, if you can even find one them, which is apparently they're hard to find right now. And there are not very many of them uh, available. So like they're just hard to get. So if you can recreate it by using a Pi, that's awesome. All right, let me, I completely ignored the chat for a while. So let me see if um, anybody is uh, saying anything in there about about this, what was going on. Um, the, I'm sure people have questions about this. This is a good question. Does the HyperDeck emulator have the same weird uniformity requirements for video resolutions as a real HyperDeck or is it more forgiving? It has been able to handle any MP4 I've thrown at it. So I don't know why it doesn't do MOVs, but it does do MP4s and it doesn't care about the, uh, about the bit rate or fr uh, frame rate or anything like that. The, I believe it may even be able to handle scaling for you because, um, like the ATEM is only going to handle 720 or, or 1080, right? But the Raspberry Pi can play whatever video as long as it outputs 1080. So, so that'd be a good experiment, but it shouldn't handle, it should handle any format. Thank you very much for the super chat. Yeah. Your HyperDeck's been on back order for two months. That is, um, unfortunate. I, I had no idea that they were just sort of out of stock everywhere. I've had mine for ages. Mine's like four or five years old, I want to say. So I, yeah, I haven't tried to buy one in a while. I do know photo Joseph is trying to get six of them. And I think he's got his hands on three of them now. So if, if any of you do have a hyperdeck you don't want, he'll buy them. So hit me up and let me know if you do have an extra one. The uh, is what on HDMI two? What was I? So the I only have one HDMI out on the Raspberry Pi right now, plugged in. I am I. Could I don't know what happens. I haven't tried a dual monitor setup on the Pi yet. So it would be interesting to actually do that because you could theoretically have another monitor on the Pi to use for other things. Like you could use, you could, you could have it be doing both HyperDeck emulation and the um, streaming bridge emulation so that you could bring in a remote stream that way. It would probably work. None of this stuff is terribly CPU intensive. Uh, Jonas says, as long as it's MP4, it doesn't care. Yeah. So 
That's awesome. How can you install the software on a computer? And, oh, you notice answered already. There'll be a Windows version in the next few weeks. Awesome. It should work anywhere as long as it's packaged up right. I don't know what it takes to package it, so maybe Mac version soon too. Oh yeah, there is a link in the description in uh, in this video. I did plan ahead a little bit. That's why I remember grabbing the link. That makes sense. The, yeah, uh, in the description of this video is the link to the software. So I will extract that in a second. Where do I get that from? And I'll just drop it in the chat for you too. It is the first link. Oh yeah, and Jonas get, uh, is giving everybody here a 10% discount on the software. So thank you for that. Show us auto roll on the Pi. Good idea. If I go back to, go back to this one. Nope, this one. So if we have the auto roll set, that should work because the, it's just going to, ATEM is going to send the play command when I switch that input. So let me switch back to input one. And then if I hit that, it should go. No. Uh oh, feature request. I thought that didn't require special uh, support of the of the emulator software. Maybe it does. So that's something to look at. First bug report. Yeah. Okay. Well, that hopefully isn't too complicated to fix. Sorry. Sorry, Jonas. All right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> need to buy a Mac first. Oh, yeah. It'll probably require building it on a Mac in order to make a Mac version. Fair enough. Oh, he says, Auto Roll didn't work for a strange reason. There's something secret it needs to do. That's so strange. I don't understand why, because I feel like it would just be the ATEM sending the play command. But clearly, I'm not the one buried deep in this protocol. So yeah, I hope best of luck figuring that one out. All right. Did you have trouble with the image file? I can't get the image to run on my RPI 4. The, uh, the thing that I noticed is it is a zip file containing a PDF and the image. It's not the image itself. So like when I, when I download the image from of, of, of Raspberry Pi OS itself, that is a zip file that is the image and then it burns onto the card. But this zip file, you have to unzip first and then there's an image inside and then it works fine. The weird thing is that I, I would have assumed that the Raspberry Pi Imager app would have like noticed and like not let me write it or something. So, um, but yeah, make sure you just unzip that first. Just bought without the discount, five seconds too late, no problem. <laughs> yes, he does deserve it. This is a lot of work. It's a lot of work to make that kind of stuff work. So I'm glad to see that it is working. And um, thank you for, for buying that. All right. That's strange. Have you had any issues with the latest Pocket camera 4K and the ATEM video quality is not usable once plugged into HDMI 1. I'm really curious what sort of artifacts you're seeing. I haven't had any problems. It's the HDMI out of the Blackmagic Pocket Camera has been great all the time. Um, if what what exactly do you mean by video quality is not usable? I guess that would be my question. Uh, speaking of Pocket 4K. Will there be overheating issues if used for a stream for three hour durations? What about the battery? The battery is dreadful. It's like super short. So don't run this off of a battery. It's not, you're not going to be happy. It's like, it'll last like, I don't know, 30 minutes or something. It's like not good. 
But if you do plug it in with the power adapter, uh, it'll run forever with no issues at all. So definitely solid for that. Um, yes, the smoke cleared out on, I want to say Friday afternoon and it just like whew, was gone within like a couple of hours and the air is very nice and I'm enjoying all of the fresh air outside. I'm going to go on another bike ride this afternoon to do some filming for the next video and I'm going to do that outside and enjoy breathing fresh, clean air. It has been fun to watch the air quality uh, meters. I got a sensor for for home and hooked it up and we're watching the indoor air quality over the whole weekend. And it was the worst I've, I, I can't even imagine. It's like, it was worse inside my house than most other cities had elsewhere. So bad news. And I did finally get a filter on Wednesday, which was several days too late, but that also helped a ton inside. Can you use the A10 Mini for the Blackmagic Multiviewer? I've never actually used the Blackmagic Multiviewer. Um, I assume that's just going to be like a regular multiviewer, so it should work fine. I don't know exactly what you'd want to be doing with it. The what is? Oh, they have a couple. They have a couple of them. So some of these are going to be SDI. I think all of them are SDI. Okay, all of their multiviewers are SDI. So you would need to use converters in order for that to work. The the because yeah, the ATEM is only only HDMI, but the HyperDeck is also SDI. That's what I've got here. I've got a converter going SDI out from the HyperDeck, converting to HDMI. Blackmagic makes converters. There's other ones. They're mostly all the same, and they'll work fine. Alan says, Stream Deck Companion iMix16 plays audio video of mixed formats and images from Stream Deck buttons, fades in and out, audio and images simultaneously. No need for HyperDeck. That's cool. The um, I'm glad that's working. Yeah, iMix16 is a really cool app too. That's uh, for an iPad and it gives you a bunch of buttons. I don't think I have it on mine right now, but it gives you a bunch of buttons for loading in video and audio and images and a lot of cool automations. The advantage of the HyperDeck or the HyperDeck emulator is that it can be triggered by the ATEM itself, which means you can then write macros. So you can you can do a lot of that with Companion, right? So like Companion is another way to sort of create virtual macros. And so yeah, there are two different approaches to the same the same thing. The fact that I can run the Stream Deck or the Companion software on a Raspberry Pi now is really appealing because it means I don't need to run that on a on a Mac, on like, like a laptop, but I still like the direct control of the ATEM talking to the HyperDeck or the emulator directly. But yeah, it's, it is more powerful having iMix 16 because you can load in more different kinds of things. Roland says, it sounds as if, as if you've been working on your audio setup. It makes a definite difference. Thanks. Um, only a little. So right now, I don't think Every time I try to undo that camera, I regret it later, so I'm not going to. But right next to me, I've got two of my little virtual sound panels. So it's not perfect in here. I can still hear the echo myself, regardless of what's making it to the stream. Still have some work to do, but it's getting better. I'm just trying to make slow improvements. Ronald says, is it possible to use a Wi-Fi video device like an Osmo? Or it, did that get cut off? Well, so Wi-Fi video, um, the Osmo, I've tried. Osmo Pocket, at least. I don't have the other Osmo action, but the Osmo Pocket, while it does have an option to be controlled and you can see it from an iPhone, there is no way to get clean HDMI out from that iPhone. Oh, thank you, I just saw my lights change. Um, the, yeah. So let me just uh, finish this Osmo thought. There's no way to get clean HDMI out from the iPhone app of the Osmo Pocket. 
unfortunately. So it's not really possible, and there is no HDMI out of the Osmo either itself. So that's not really an option. As for other wireless video, there are lots of options. And that's actually what I'm going to go film later this afternoon, is trying out a couple of different uh, different devices. And one is one is the one I used on the stream last week. Where did it go? Oh, it's back here. One of them is the one I'm using, uh, the Hollyland Mars 300 Pro. Better be in here. So this is the Hollyland Mars 300 Pro. You might notice there's no antennas poking out because it is all built in now, which is really cool. The other one is this CineEye 2 Pro, which does have antennas. It actually has four antennas, and they're just in this little bag. So it looks like a giant spider once it's all connected. So I'm going to compare these two, see how they do, because I'm really curious how far these are going to reach. So I'm actually going back to the same place I was last week, back to that spot below the bridge, and I'm going to go right, right across the bridge and see how far I get before the signal drops. So that should be, that should be fun. Um, Ralph, thank you for the super chat. Appreciate it. Hyperdeck emulator compatible via OBS and Windows version coming soon. So the Hyperdeck emulator is this software that runs on the, right now Raspberry Pi. It's packaged up for Linux. Sounds like Jonas is going to package it up for the for Windows. And once that's once that's running, it plays out over HDMI. So bringing that into OBS, you'd use a capture card, I guess. I don't think there's a. Oh, I guess you could actually. Is, there is another trick, which is um, because I can view the video from a web page on my computer, I could have OBS capture that web page as an input, which is like a weird roundabout way to do it. I feel like if you're going to go through that many hoops, you're better off just playing clips directly in OBS. Um, but those are some ideas to think about. Thank you for the super chat. Where was I? Where was I in the, the chat? I think I, I feel like I skipped a whole bunch. I did. I did skip a whole bunch. All right, let me go back. Roland says, at the B&H pre-order page, product specialist states in the Q&A that will accept input for ATEM minis and not generic RTMP streams. See, that's what B&H would say, or that's what Blackmagic would say. I, we'll see. I, I have zero idea. I, I'm hoping that it doesn't support generic RTMP means you have to go through a bunch of hoops to make it work. Because um, I know they are going to be doing some fancy stuff with network with networking in order to make it handle like NAT traversal and stuff. So it, that stuff I'm sure won't work from a generic RTMP uh, stream, but we'll see. I'm going to try that. I'm definitely going to try that out. So yeah. Uh, Nate, speaking of that, Nathan says, do you think it's feasible to run both the HyperDuck emulator and the stream bridge emulator on the Raspberry Pi at the same time? I have a feeling it is. So like if I look at the Raspberry Pi right now, do I have it playing? Let me hit play. Okay, so it's playing a clip. And if I go look at the CPU usage, I'm wondering what what that's gonna be. Let me show you what I'm doing here. So if I just log into 4717. I really should give that a better IP address on my network. So this is using a bunch of threads, but okay, so it's about a quarter of the CPU. The RTMP stuff, um, that used almost none because it's not actually transcoding video. It's just moving bytes around. This is actually like obviously decoding video and showing it on a screen. But the RTMP server didn't actually do that. So it's just passing data from one thing to another. So I think it's very likely possible that it could run both. And because it has a two, two monitors, uh, two HDMI outs, probably. Probably work.
Any idea of, I'm assuming that's gigabytes per hour or per minute recording full HD on the A10 Mini Pro ISO. Um, I don't remember off the top of my head, the it does record 70 megabit per second ISO feeds. So each of the four will be recorded at 70 each, plus whatever your program out is. So if you're streaming, that's six or whatever, right? So uh, two, 70, 70, 280 megabits a second ish, so 300 megabits, let's say. Um, what that translates into gigabytes per hour, I don't know off the top of my head. That's some um, math you could do. Uh, I will say that when you plug in a hard drive, it tells you approximately how much time is left. So that's one thing you can look at too. Two super chats. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. And from Michael, I want a macro that changes the ISO output to streaming high when on air and changes back to hyperdeck high when off air can't get the macro to work. That's interesting. I haven't tried that one. Should we try and see what happens and maybe see what's wrong with it? Because I can do that with my test one. So if I have my, let's make a macro. Let's make a macro here called, uh, let's see, set it to streaming high when on air. So start streaming record we're going to oh i have no idea where where can i stream to that's not going to um let's try this one and just put in a junk streaming key so set it to streaming high let's make sure we toggle that and then on air. Okay. So that's, yeah, I know the stream key isn't working. Stop recording. And then stop streaming. We'll record that. And we're going to press on air. So the, and then press off. We'll just delete the other one, change that back to hyperdeck high. And then I don't have a drive plugged in. This might work. It's a little USB drive. And if I have a drive plugged in, then we should see, we should see the drive. Come on. No, it's not recognizing it. I swear this one worked earlier. Oh, this isn't the ISO. Minor problem. Um, I, well, I'm assuming it's the same. Okay, there it goes. Found the drive, record, and we'll stop that. stop that. Now we save this out. Test. Let's just save only the macros and load that up here and see what we just recorded. So macros, start streaming. Chose the service, stream key, yeah, blah, 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 and did set the bit rate. I see it. Oh, you can't see that. I need to move this up on the screen. So it did set the bit rate here. Streaming false, switch the bit rate and the audio bit rate, and then started recording. So that should work. So if I go back to the macro now and play it, when I, can you see this over here? Let me get rid of the chat for a second. When I press Start streaming. Yeah, and change the bit rate. Cool. Stop streaming. Oh, I see what's happening. I think we can fix this. I think we need to add a delay. Because when you when you press stop streaming, it doesn't immediately stop. So if we go back into here and then say macro sleep. So if we give it like when we stop streaming, if we give it like two seconds before changing the bit rate, then I think this is going to work. So let's restore this test, restore the macros, try this again, start streaming six megabits, stop streaming. Notice how it doesn't immediately stop. Waits two seconds. Oh, didn't do it. All right. It may just be 
I'm going to try one more, waiting four seconds, and then we're going to give up. And I'll deal with, I'll figure this out later. I don't understand why this wouldn't be possible. All right, streaming, stop streaming. One, two, three, four. There it goes. Now it changed the quality and now it's recording. So that's what it is, is it needs some time after it stops streaming in order to, before you can change the bit right back down. So here you go. Thanks for the super chat. That was fun. All right, where was I? Scrolling back through the chat, trying to find where I was. Oh my gosh, I'm way behind. I'm sorry. We're almost out of time too. Jeez. A lot of good questions today. <laughs> okay. Uh, Curtis says, does your HyperDeck mini fan make a lot of noise? I used a HyperDeck Studio Pro and wow, it was too loud. Yes. Yes, it does. It makes too much noise and I replaced the fan. I took it out and replaced it with a fan that makes zero noise. And I've been so happy. Uh, otherwise, yeah, I would not be able to use it in this room. I did film the whole process of doing that. There's a video on YouTube already. Like someone made a, t a tutorial of how to do it, which is a video I followed. So just search for uh, like HyperDeck mini fan replacement, you'll find it. But I did film my process of doing it and I still planning on editing it, editing it together. Uh, we'll see how long it takes me to actually get to editing that footage. I also replaced it in my TV studio and I did not have as good results with that. So it should still be an interesting video once I edit that, but you can definitely replace the fan. I'm going to guess I don't know the answer to this. Um, do you know of a way of sending the program feed from ATEM Mini to Android device wirelessly? Oh, uh, well, yeah, actually, these, these things will do it. These, both of the, both the Hollyland Mars 300 Pro and the CineEye Pro, I forget the model number, I'm going to be doing a video about this. Both of these have apps you can load up on your phone to see them. So you could run the program out, HDMI out from your ATEM into one of these to get a wireless monitor for it, which is pretty cool. And... Thank you for the super chat. Jonathan, what's your story? How does a programmer get so involved in video production? Um, thanks. So yeah, that is a good question. I, my background is definitely in the software development. I've been doing that forever, ever. Like I started writing code when I was like eight years old and the, um, How did I get into video production? I guess because I've always enjoyed video stuff as well. And like, I have a pile of old magnetic, like DV tapes. I don't remember the exact kind of tape anymore, but from like old video projects I was doing like a long time ago, 10 or 20 years ago. And that's, um, that is, yeah. I don't know, I just sort of grown I've just, it's just sort of grown on me and I started doing, I get, it really started ramping up when I started, um, like I do a lot of talks at conferences, well did when conferences existed and I have a lot of friends who run conferences. And one of the ways I started getting into more, more into video stuff was by offering to film conferences. And I started out just doing it for free and then started charging people. And I had a business doing that for a little while. And, um, that was how, that's when I got my first, ATEM television studio and the HyperDeck and all that for that gear. And, um, there's a video, a pretty fun video on my channel a while ago where I talked about the whole process of doing that, of setting up the video rig on a bike and going and filming a conference. So yeah, I don't know. It's, it's just always been a thing that I've enjoyed. And yeah, I do. Um, I'm seeing some, 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 comments, please don't spam the chat. I'm going to, if you do spam the chat, I'm going to remove you from the channel. However, I will, um, get to the questions uh, if we don't run out of time, but super chat's a good way to skip the line, but I am trying to go through all the questions in order otherwise, but again, make sure you mention my name. Otherwise I can't, I can't see it in the back, in the scroll back.
Peter says, I want to use two ATEM minis to take the USB from the first into Zoom, okay? And a second ATEM ISO connected with the output to a camera in the first to record what I am doing. I control the ISO with macros. Could I control the first ATEM with ATEM OSC as well? Yeah, so if they're both on the network, they, they both have to be on the network. That's basically what I'm doing here. So the they're both on the network different IPs, and then you would have to be able to, so actually I don't know about um, about ATEM OSC, now that I'm thinking through this out loud. I think ATEM OSC may only be able to control one ATEM. I don't know, can you run a second copy of ATEM OSC? Because that's how you'd have to be able to do it. If not, I do recommend switching over to Companion, because Companion can control multiple ATEMs. So that's what I'm doing here, is I've got Companion running and it has both, um, I should be able to actually show that to you and on my screen. So this is my companion running and it's got two instances of my ATEM. So it's got my pro and my ISO that are on my desk here. And um, I have my, have my TV SHD in here as well, which I'm going to just get rid of because I am not using that anymore. So there's the IP of this one and there's the IP of this one. And now when I go make buttons, I can actually go in and say, like, um, this one, for example, this will actually do this on the pro, which is changing the program, set the aux bus, which sets the HDMI out. And then on the ISO, I change to where the back ATEM is coming in on. And that's all done because Companion does know how to talk to multiple. So I don't remember if the ATEM OSC program can do that. If not, that's how I would do this. All right. What is the small thing on your desk that has what looks like a keyboard plus a red light? Oh, this. It is a keyboard. It's a tiny little keyboard that I use for the Raspberry Pi. The reason I use this is because it also has a trackpad, so I can use a mouse on the Pi, and I don't want to have to have an actual mouse on the desk. Um, this is like $10 or something. It's like not even, yeah. <laughs> uh, can you drop a link to the dual monitor stand you use? Um, it's actually a, like, yeah, it's got these crazy arms. I, I showed it last, no, in the 10K stream. Go to there, because I've got my desk tour in that, and I walked around the back. I think there's a link to it, though, in this video already. Let me double check. Um, my, it's, well, nope, I don't see it here. Okay. Um, it's definitely in the video from the, the 10 K stream. So go check that one out. It's just two weeks ago. Brian says, it seems you always have the streaming XML and other files open. Are you running a macro from the stream deck to open your XML files? No, I use sublime text and it has like different, like you can open a window and then have a bunch of tabs and then open like a second copy of it and different stuff. So I have like one of those for every project. And I, it just, honestly, I just haven't ever closed that window. Like I don't reboot this computer. Even when I do reboot it, Sublime just loads up the, the state again. It's kind of like, it's like Chrome where it just remembers what you had open and brings it all back. So it's just always open. Uh, Hisham says, I'm using the Chromecast and Apple TV as a source of HDMI input from my computers wirelessly into the ATEM, and it works fine because I have Wi-Fi with SSID just for them. Oh, so yeah, if you have a Wi-Fi that's dedicated to this, this purpose, which is a good plan, and I should probably do that. I don't have that in here. Um, that's great. Yeah, that's awesome. With, with good wireless, you can absolutely do that, no problem. You can buy an Ethernet adapter for your Chromecast. I had no idea that was possible. You can't even use a different power supply with the Chromecast. Like the USB cable won't work with, unless you use the Chromecast USB cable, which I don't understand. So I'm surprised they have an Ethernet adapter, uh, but that's awesome. That's super cool. Okay. I caught up to where I was at before, and now let me uh, skip through. Walter says, thanks for using the yellow box. Got to see it in action. Yeah, that was fun. I had a good time with that, even though it only lasted a half hour out in that smoke. But the, uh, it was fun to, to actually use that. Oh, and ironically, literally the next day, they, they released a software update. So it's at version 3 now. 
And that means everything you saw when I was showing the screen of that, it's all changed now. It's actually way better. So I'm going to do like an actual video talking about like showing the interface and showing streaming from it in a better, better close-ups than just sort of the on the fly stuff we did last week. Uh, but it's so much better now. And I'm so happy. So yeah, very, very excited for that. Alan says, I mix 16 pro for the Mac works too. All done with OSC. Oh, cool. What was, was that about? I don't remember what that was now, but I'm, I thought I mix 16 was only for an, for an iPad. That's awesome. If there's a Mac version, that's super cool. Patrick says any experience with cheaper wireless HDMI, the Hollyland products are a little out of budget. I know they're not, they're not cheap. Uh, I will say they're worth it. And you probably do want to get the expensive ones. Not that like you don't need the four thousand dollar ones, but like the the Mars Standard Pro is a good deal for that. The reason is because I so I have used some of the cheap ones, like the eighty dollar wireless HDMI's. Those are not good. They have a lot of problems, and like they work, but they're way delayed. For example, and the delay is not even consistent. So like I used that in when I was at the the, the video I did talking about filming Donut JS last conference I went to was in February. Um, I used the, I used the wireless HDMI for that because I needed to, I didn't want to run a cable across the room with us with such a short event. I don't like spending that much time running cables and tearing down cables. So I try to do everything just where I can just come in, drop everything in and then, and clean up quick. So wireless is great for that. And I use one of those cheap ones and it gets the job done. Like it sends the slides back to me, right? So I can mix in the slides. And when it's just slides, it's not that bad if it's delayed. So if it's like even a full second or two delayed, it's probably not the end of the world by the time I'm mixing that into the video. If it was moving, if it was like somebody talking or even just motion on a stage, it would be unacceptable. And the worst part about those is that the delay is not consistent. So it'll change partway through. So I do not recommend skimping out if you need wireless HDMI for actual video work. Um, can the simulator also be used with chroma key to add lower thirds? Yeah. So at that point, like i I just had full screen video clips on mine, but like if you have a video clip that is meant to be keyed in either green screen or Luma keyed, you can, it's just a video source by the, by the time it hits your ATEM. So it would hundred percent work. Um, the only difference between that and the HyperDeck is that the HyperDeck supports splitting out a video with an alpha channel into two signals, and this does not yet. I guess he could do it, but that would take a lot more processing on the Pi. I don't know how that would work. But the there's only one, like it's playing a video clip full screen, whereas the HyperDeck can split the alpha channel into a separate feed, so you can do proper keying on the ATEM. Only got a couple more minutes. Let's see how many of these I can get through. I was thinking about daisy chaining an ATEM Mini Pro to an ATEM Mini Pro, ISO to a Pro, so I can stream through Ecamm and also record through the ISO. You can do that. You can definitely do that. The trick is going to be getting your inputs mirrored into both. So HDMI splitters will work on some sources, and they won't work on other sources. It'll depend on the source. But I've had, like right now, my camera, this camera that you're looking at is sent through one of those cheap HDMI splitters that I've got. I've got links to them everywhere. And it's sending my camera into both ATEMs so that I can show you my video in both. So that would totally work. The ATEM Mini Pro is not recognized by a modern NEC projector and older one accepted the signal. Any ideas? Um, that's interesting. So I have seen that there are some monitors are not compatible with the ATEM Mini Pro HDMI out. I don't know why. I know they shipped an update to make it more compatible with more monitors earlier. That hasn't solved the entire problem. So I don't know what the problem is. I hope they fix it. Um, did you use a workaround to split audio from the computer via DMD HDMI to SDI converter and back? I need to make Zoom audio hearable. Ooh, no, I haven't done that kind of workflow yet. I'm going to, I am going to try to do that kind of stuff though. So hopefully I'll come back with some more notes later. 
Oh, someone did make a clean HDMI for the Osmo Pocket. That's interesting. I should look into that. Okay. Um, Ray, I think I talked about my audio on the ATEM Mini in another stream. Don't have enough time for that today. Unfortunately, I don't remember the stream off the top of my head. But it is, I know I've talked about it before. Um, all right. Oh, here's a good one. There are several RTMP ingest players for cheap. So, these are not the same thing as a streaming bridge. The RTMP players will ex expect to be able to tap into an RTMP stream that exists on another server. So if you have, so if you like the, what I did on the Raspberry Pi was I set up Nginx with a plugin with the RTMP module to turn it into an RTMP server. So then a RTMP client can push to it and an RTMP player can pull from it. Now, if you do that and set it up on like a cloud server, you can use one of these cheap RTMP players because you can set that player to pull from that server. What the streaming bridge does, and what I did on the video last week, was I built the RTMP server into the Raspberry Pi, and that's what the stream, stream bridge does as well, is it builds it into that device. And that way, it's acting as both of those roles. So there's three roles involved, right? There's the RTMP source, like the ATM Mini Pro. There's the, the server up at the top that's going to accept that feed, and then it will make that feed available to players, which can be you can have more than one of them playing that RTMP feed. And these cheap things on Amazon are the player, but they're not going to act as the source that the ATM Mini Pro can stream to. So that's why the streaming bridge is very cool. That's the, that's the takeaway there. All right. Um, oh, Alan did the math. 280 megabits a second converts to 126 gigs per hour. Cool. That's pretty good. So yeah, you can grab a 128 gig uh, USB drive and record for an hour, which is a conference talk. The Oh, Michael says, but the streaming setting is blank in your macro, which is what happens to me. That was that's a good point. I don't know why it was blank. I don't think that means it didn't work. It just means that the setting that it's set to, it wasn't able to match back up to the interface, but I think it still is set to that bit rate. And you could test that by actually doing, uh, looking at the recording that it made after that. Um, okay. I'm going to try to catch up real quick because I am running, I am running out of time. I'm out of time and I do want to be able to go record today. I'm trying to record the, uh, wireless tests, wireless HDMI tests. Um, how do you do your OAuth stream? I do use StreamYard for that. That is, um, we actually both have A10 Minis, so we're both plugged into A10 Minis into StreamYard, but StreamYard's the one doing the, the video mixing on those streams. At some point, I want to see if I can do it with the streaming bridge since we both do have A10 Minis, so we'll see when I get a chance to do that. Do I have to use a router or can I use an unmanaged switch? You can use an unmanaged switch. The trick is you would have to set manual IPs on all your devices. A router will be a DHCP server, so it can hand out IPs. If you don't have a router, you would need to manually set the IP on all the devices, which honestly is probably fine because then you actually know what they all are also. All right, I'm going to skip the, answer, the questions I don't have answers to. Um, how do you know when it's safe to eject the disk after recording? You stop the recording to make sure it doesn't lose your work in the middle. I'm pretty sure Grant demoed in the announcement yanking the drive mid-recording. So I want to say it doesn't matter. If you do hit stop, that's safer. And as soon as you hit stop and it, and it says it stopped, that's fine. But I'm pretty sure he demoed just yanking the drive out, which was, I think, pretty cool. All right. That is... Uh, that's it. That's all I've got for today. Um, I hope I answered enough questions. Um, sorry to cut a little bit short. Sometimes I go for 90 minutes. Not today. I want to get out and enjoy the fresh air and do some shooting. So thanks always. Thanks as always for all the super chats. Thanks for your questions. Keep an eye on this channel. Again, I'm hopefully going to have some fun videos coming out soon. Probably not this week, maybe next week going to talk about these wireless HDMI transmitters uh, that I am trying out thanks to Hollyland and 
Cine Eye for sending them over. So I'll have some fun things to report back to you after this afternoon when I go and try these out. Apologies for the music that's about to be probably a little bit too loud when I do the outro. I'm going to tune my music situation in uh, a little later as well. But thanks all for watching and have a great rest of the day.